So good afternoon. I'm pleased to see all of you here today. I'm Karen Gallagher. I'm Dean of the Rossier School of Education. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the 35th Pullius Lecture. If you look in your uh, programs, you will see all of the distinguished lecturers who have come before. I think this, uh, the Pullius Lecture has become one of the most prestigious gatherings in higher education and has featured some of the most impressive scholars. And I think if you look over the, the list of who has come before, you will agree. Today, this 35th lecture will be no exception, and I know um, I join all of you in your anticipation of the remarks of Dr. Nancy Zimfer. I've actually followed Nancy's career for, I, well, over 20 years. We were in Ohio together. I was at the University of Cincinnati, and Nancy was at the, uh, the Ohio State University. Um, and I'll tell you this, uh, in every leadership position that Nancy has held, whether formal or informal, she has focused her efforts on making a difference for students, for teachers, for faculty, and for the surrounding communities in which uh, her institutions uh, are found. And she has succeeded. So welcome to USC, Nancy. We're glad you're here, and I look forward to your remarks. So let me uh, take a moment to introduce to one special person we have here today. You're all special, but one special person, uh, and that is Carol Fox, who is both the Board of Trustee and uh, Chair of our Board of Counselors. Before I continue, I need to convey the regrets of Dr. Bill Tierney, who is the director of the uh, Pulleyus Center. In all the years I've known him, he's never been sick, but today he has the flu. So we do appreciate that he didn't come and soldier on and share that with us, but uh, really it is something as like the flu would keep him from here today, uh, from coming today. We're very grateful to the family of the Earl V. Pullius, uh, of Earl V. Pullius, for making not only this lecture series possible, but for endowing the Pullius Center for Higher Education. For those of you who don't know his name, Dr. Earl Pullius was the, one of the founding faculty members of the USC Department of Higher Education in 1957. He was a prolific writer on the philosophical issues on higher learning. In the years since Dr. Pullius established the department, the school's research areas have evolved to explore the critical issues of the times, including college access for underserved students, the role of for-profit colleges, and the changing status of the professoriate. As dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, this is, I, I have a chance, and particularly with Bill not being here, uh, to brag a bit about the Pullius Center. Under his leadership, and you need to understand that not only is Bill the uh, director of the Pullius Center, he's a university professor, and he's the holder of the Wilbur Kiefer Professorship in Higher Education. And under his leadership, the Pullius Center studies and impacts higher ed policy on a worldwide basis. But the work of the center is impacting us here in our community, too literally touching and changing the lives of students for whom higher education seems like a hopeless fantasy. Let me share just a bit about what uh, we're doing with these students. For over 10 years, the Pullius Center has run a program called Summertime. Through Summertime, the center brings on our campus local underserved high school graduates who have made it successfully through high school and have been admitted to college. And they spend six weeks uh, working on sharpening their communication skills. These students have the drive, they have the energy, the passion, and the intelligence, but in far too many cases, they have not been taught the critical writing skills that will help them succeed as a college freshman. Pullius Center offers intensive writing workshops and also some basic instruction on college life, study habits, and work skills. Our summertime students report back that the program was instrumental in helping them succeed in their first year of college. The Pulley Center also offers high need students who are still in high school the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one mentoring with a USC faculty member or staff member through the IM program, which stands for Increasing Access via Mentoring, 
Local students have an adult advocate to help them with both academic needs and personal issues. And for many, this advocate can chart the road for success to, uh, in high school. And now, beyond our face-to-face -face support for local students, the Police Center has also begun a program that can touch students wherever they have an internet access. A new suite of games called Collegeology is now helping teenagers on Facebook with a game that teaches them how to navigate the daunting college application process, from filling out forms to applying for financial aid and to managing deadlines. And I'm very proud and supportive of this work and the entire Polius Center team that leads it. And I'm actually proud to, uh, that I get to introduce one of those team members today. Dr. Adriana Kizar is the new co-founder of the, uh, pardon me, co-director of the Polius Center. Her work, particularly in the area of adjunct and non-tenure track faculty, has been quoted continuously in the media over the last several months. She's also widely published and cited in the areas of higher ed leadership and governance, diversity and equity, collaboration and partnerships, and the need of low-income students. I'm pleased to share with our audience that Dr. Kizar has just been made the co-director. Uh, we're thrilled, and Bill wishes he was here to be able to share that news with you, but congratulations, Adriana. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Adriana Kizar to the podium. Welcome, everyone. And thank you, Dean Gallagher. I really appreciate the introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here to introduce our speaker today, as well as update you on, gonna, uh, on a few things that the Polio Center's been doing uh, recently. Um, we've been busy again this year, and I'll highlight just a few of these efforts, but I really want you uh, to go to our website to get continual updates of some of the exciting projects. Um, first, this spring, in conjunction with the annual AERA conference, um, where many of you know Bill Tierney is currently um, president of AERA. Um, the Polia Center is hosting a day-long meeting with 100 of the most important gaming uh, development leaders, venture capitalists, and researchers in the gaming world. This leadership role in the gaming and education world um, will continue this summer at a conference we'll have hosted here at USC. Um, the Polia Center is becoming a national leader in the kind of the use of technology to improve college access. Also, um, this spring, Bill Tierney has been invited to speak at a symposium for the future of California higher education, something near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, this is one of several such discussions that Bill Tierney um, has either hosted or been a part of in the last uh, two years. Um, Karen, um, thank you for mentioning Collegeology, which is an important uh, project of the Polius Center. And the Polius Center is um, continuing to collaborate with USC's um, Game Innovation Lab and using game-based strategies um, to engage students in college preparation, but now at the middle school level. So after launching um, mission admission to the national audience, the team has now turned the attention to the middle school, and in March, they will be launching Future Bound, uh, a downloadable role-play game that informs players about college and career trajectories and cultivates positive decision-making skills. So that's just fresh uh, coming to us. Um, we also re received a grant this year from the National Science Foundation that I'll be leading that looks at undergraduate STEM reform networks um, that are engaging faculty in reform. And some of these networks are large enough where they have seven to 10,000 faculty across the country that are working to enhance STEM uh, education towards the role of enrolling uh, more students in STEM and increasing their graduation rates. Um, this project builds on a, a decade of work in undergraduate STEM reform um, that I've been conducting that works with these networks to better understand how they can, uh, we can create change in higher education and the role of faculty in this process. Um, the end result will be a set of strategies and design principles that will help um, guide NSF and other groups interested um, in continuing um, to support these kinds of uh, reform networks. Um, so we're very excited about these many projects that are going on at the center. And so, as I said, there's too many to mention here, but we really hope that you will visit uh, the website to hear more about the continuing um, efforts. Most importantly, though, I'm honored to introduce our speaker today for the annual Polius Lecture. As I started my research career that Karen mentioned on leadership and change in higher education, 
two decades ago. Little did I know how often Dr. Nancy Zimfer's name uh, would come up. Uh, in a study that I was conducting on transformational change on college campuses, uh, Dr. Zimfer was noted as one of higher education's most innovative leaders, repeatedly by people. And when the American Council on Education asked me to conduct a study of college presidents who'd made substantial progress on campus diversity efforts, Dr. Zimfer was nominated and interviewed for this study um, that resulted in a publication for ACE that went out to all college presidents. And it was through these interviews that I became aware of how truly visionary, strategic, and thoughtful uh, Nancy was. Then through my work at the Association with Governing Boards, I'd heard about Nancy as a national leader who worked beyond the campuses where she was president or chancellor. At the University of Cincinnati, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and now at the SUNY system. And she's really worked as a national leader on community engagement, school and university partnerships, diversity, economic development, and college access. Her work as an innovator and commitment to education are among the reasons that she was chosen to come to this annual Polius Lecture. It's no surprise that having demonstrated this leadership at so many institutions within the overall enterprise that Dr. Zimfer became Chancellor of the SUNY system, the nation's largest comprehensive system of higher education. Since joining the system, she's put in place a strategic plan focused on research and innovation, energy, healthcare, global affairs, um, and the education pipeline ever at, uh, at the core. A colleague at um, this institution shared this about Nancy. She is energetic, smart, to the point, ethical, and displays a practice of leadership that is underscored by an unmistakable commitment to doing the right thing. And she challenges her colleagues, many of whom are often not used to being challenged. Several people also noted that she has quietly mentored some of the best of the new generation of women administrators in higher education, furthering her contribution to our field. It's also important to note that Nancy has her PhD in teacher education, so she's a friend of schools of education and understands the important role within the university and the broader education agenda. Colleagues note that Dr. Zimfer is an un unapologetic about her uh, roots in teaching and she's always had her priorities straight in terms of the, the deep educational mission of institutions of higher education. While I could continue my praise of this esteemed speaker, I want you to hear her ideas and have the same hope for higher education that I've developed from knowing such great leaders continue to emerge within the higher education enterprise like Dr. Nancy Zimfer. So with no further ado, uh, Dr. Nancy Zimfer and her talk is named Universities as Engines of Economic Growth and Educational Success. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, I am truly thrilled to be here, and uh, it's a coast-to-coast -coast ride. Uh, one does not get the opportunity often to come. How thoughtful of you to make it February. Uh, as it is very cold in, uh, in New York. Uh, Trustee Fox, it's delightful to be here with you. I had a wonderful session earlier today with uh, President Max uh, Nakias, and uh, he went out of his way to say how privileged he is to work with such a fine board of trustees, and now I know why. And I thank you for your council leadership of the Razia uh, School of Education. And what a find you have in Karen Gallagher. We do go back a number of years, and I can remember that we have been reformers in teacher education for all those years, uh, really worked together on what could really make our schools of education uh, the dynamic and important schools that they are to our society. And uh, I hated to lose Karen to the Midwest. Truly, I did. But if you keep inviting me to California, it's okay. And Adriana, I want to offer you congratulations. And I do miss Bill Tierney. I will see him at AERA. You should be very proud of the fact that one of your colleagues is president of that really esteemed Educational Research Association. And uh, I think he's made a fine choice in the co-director of the Polias Center. So congratulations. Uh, Adriana has been my host uh, all afternoon, and I really, really appreciate it. I did my own uh, research on the Polias Lecture, and um, I discovered 
something really amazing. The second lecture in its 34-year history was given by Ernest Boyer. And at that time, he was director of the Carnegie Center for the Advancement of Teaching, but he had previously been chancellor of SUNY. So I thought that was a massive coincidence. And then, as I uh, tiptoed through the years, I found Bruce Johnstone. Bruce Johnstone is a scholar of comparative higher education, still travels around the world studying different systems of higher education, and he was the 26th lecturer, and he was a chancellor at the State University of New York. Who knew? And then, of course, Steve Sample, who came from the University at Buffalo to uh, USC, so that's a wonderful coincidence. And then, of course, in meeting the president, he, too, gave the polius lecture. So I am overwhelmed by my predecessors and a little awestruck, so I just want you to know that. So I, I give thanks to you who have taken the time to come. Uh, I know that some of you are students of higher education, a number of you are faculty members in the school, at the center, and around the campus, and around the region, so I am honored by your presence. I, uh, I brought pictures uh, because I think there is something uh, about two messages, so I will be creating a bit of a mental model, uh, and um, I'm actually going to tell a story through my eyes as chancellor of the State University of New York, not uh, which is the fashion of university presidents to brag a lot. Rather, I'm just going to sort of tell you how it is, how it works, how challenging it is, and seek your advice during the Q&A. So when you see a place where you think you could improve the message, fire away. Uh, in my teaching career, I taught curriculum in higher education. I taught the college teaching course at Ohio State for a dozen years. And, uh, you know, since pedagogy is not a requirement of the doctorate in most places, the students who came to my class would often say, I didn't tell my major advisor I was taking this course. Please don't, since 75% of all PhDs end up in teaching universities. Um, I do think that we need to pay more attention to pedagogy. I taught uh, adult development, cognitive development, and uh, every chance I got, I, I taught teachers. So today, I, um, I would like to give you a little context for the State University of New York, just so you can walk a mile in my shoes or feel my pain or however it gets translated to you, and then try to make two cases. The role of higher education as an engine for economic growth and economic revitalization, and everyone knows we need it, so it does seem an appropriate role for higher education. And then secondly, the role of higher education in educational success. So I really only want to make two big points, and I'm, I'm going to be somewhat redundant to do so. But I, I really should... Uh, frame the SUNY experience for you. Um, I, I often say it this way. SUNY has 64 campuses, 30 of which are community colleges. Another 20 or so are comprehensive baccalaureate institutions, four doctoral institutions, two freestanding medical schools, an optometry school, and a partridge in a pear tree. We are all of it. All in, in one unit, we uh, educate about 465,000 students a year. We have 88,000 faculty and staff, 3 million alumni. But when I say we are the largest, most comprehensive system of public higher education in the country, I always uh, give one cautionary note. If California were to unify Cal State, the community colleges, and UC into one administered system under one board of trustees, you would be China. But you aren't. You are three separate systems. And you articulate, I, I know that you do, uh, but not quite in the same way as if you were all under one umbrella. So in, in painting a little context for you, I drew up some of my favorite uh, inspirations. So this is the year of the movie, the year of the book, the year of the second inaugural, uh, much attention to Lincoln in the comparisons of the Obama speech, the, the experience of the inaugural, and the guy next to him is Justin Morrill. So I only wanted to draw attention to one of 
arguably only three or four major legislative uh, interventions in higher education in the history of our country. Clearly, the Land Grant Act has to be one of them. This is its 150th anniversary. We've celebrated all year, and Justin Morrow was the uh, congressional uh, signer of the Land Grant Act and uh, a resident of Vermont, and we did have one of our conferences at uh, the University of Vermont just to celebrate his fine work. I take inspiration from this, and uh, in New York, the Land Grant University is Cornell, so what I always have to say is, if imitation is the finest form of flattery, and if Justin Morrill and Abe Lincoln were alive today, surely they would think that the State University of New York should have been the land-grant institution. So as it is, we partner well with Cornell. I also, for those of you who are students of higher education, I am inspired by the concept of anchor institutions. Some say that this concept was invented by Michael Porter at Harvard. Maybe it is so. I have heard it from many, many voices that institutions like universities and schools and libraries and even sports arenas and museums and parks are place-bound institutions committed to where they are planted. And on some of my frustrating days, maybe the days when I'm testifying on the budget hearing at the state of New York, I say, you know what? You've got to support us because I don't want to have to move our corporate headquarters to New Jersey. But of course, I'm not moving the State University of New York. It is an anchor institution of the state and thereby is obliged to serve the state. So I, I take inspiration from this work. I also take inspiration from this guy. This is Nelson Rockefeller, for those of you who are generationally challenged. Um, <laughs> He was governor of the state when SUNY was formed 64 years ago, and he called this his highest, his most important accomplishment, to knit together a series of institutions that had been freestanding, many of them over uh, almost 100 years when he formed the system. And today, I think we are trying to live up to the vision Nelson Rockefeller had of what public higher education could mean to New York. And uh, here's a little Wikipedia for you. Um, I forget who it is that made up the phrase truthiness. I think it's Colbert. <laughs> and uh, we're trying to get on the Colbert show with systemness. Uh, if there's a linguist in the audience, ness is a suffix. It should only be attached to adjectives. System is a noun. So we've broken a few linguistic rules. But truly, one of the other contextual and inspiring uh, claims that is important to us in a large and comprehensive system is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. How can we so work together that we can have more impact than any single institution could ever deem to, deem to have? So we had, a, we had to find a word for it, and we've got it on Wikipedia, and you know the rules of Wikipedia. Nobody's knocked it off yet. We're still there. And uh, another of my, I think I have five or six of these, I'm almost to the point here, another of my inspirations comes from Jim Collins. Um, I am a make me better advocate. When I go into the bookstore, that's where I go. Diet books, cookbooks, how to get along with your mother-in-law, the whole deal. But this, this is about discipline. This good to great, which people bemoan as a message to higher education that we need to act more like a business. I take, on the contrary, to say, no, we need to make disciplined decisions by disciplined people who adhere to disciplined outcomes. And that's why this, uh, this theme, this good to great, has been so powerful for, for me and for us at SUNY to be more disciplined. And then, um, just to make Karen homesick, this is five-way chili. Cincinnati chili, Skyline chili, and I just threw it up here because I wanted to remind you that in addition to the inspiration of the Land Grant Act and Justin Morrill and Michael Porter and his anchoredness and Rockefeller and Jim Collins and other people I've cited, I have a personal theory of leadership. It begins with vision at the hands of many around strategic actions for which we hold ourselves accountable, 
finding the pocketbook to make, uh, meet our aspirations, and constantly telling the story. So sometimes I could spend two, three hours on my personal theory of leadership, but I just wanted to ground you in uh, this notion that institutions, good institutions, great institutions, are led by vision, but vision that is crafted by many. So that begins the story of SUNY. When I arrived at SUNY uh, as a new president, and this was my third turn at bat, I get the question, what are you going to do first? I've always thought it a bit lame to say, I'm going to listen. I know listening is really important, but it just didn't seem like enough to me. So I said, I'm going to visit all 64 of the campuses. I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea how big the state of New York is. And uh, 7,500 miles later in a Chevy Ta Tahoe after 95 days on the road, I did manage to spend a half a day at every one of our campuses. And I did listen. And I learned a lot about the role of these campuses 30 miles from every New Yorker across the state of New York. And repeatedly, I heard the message that SUNY could be an economic engine for New York's revitalization. This is 2009. We're just in the throes of understanding what lies ahead. And over and over again, I heard people talk about a phrase that Jim Collins turns, the big, hairy, audacious goal, as the possibility that a large, comprehensive, public, highly diverse system of higher education could be the economic engine for New York's revitalization. And in deference to all those people who thought we were selling out to corporate America, we added and enhanced the quality of life of every New Yorker. So as uh, someone who believes that institutions need to set a vision, we use this as a hypothesis, a hypothesis that over the next 10 months, we tested across the state. We convened faculty and staff and students and chambers of commerce and legislative leaders, and we put the question to them, can a comprehensive public higher education system possibly serve the role of economic engine? And out of that, we distilled in this big, hairy, audacious goal a set of six big ideas that we thought a university could do to contribute to the economic welfare of a state. Could be New York, could be the great systems of Texas and Maryland and North Carolina and California that play such an important role in economic revitalization. So we started down a path where we put a stake in the ground for entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, the seamless education pipeline, which I will unpack, define, and talk about a little bit later. We have four medical schools, as I said, an optometry school, a dentistry school, a veterinary school. If we can't help make New York healthier, I don't know who can, but more importantly, if we can't get health care professionals to those communities that need them most, what else would a public system of higher education do, if not that? Um, we are probably, arguably, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but one of the biggest land, own, land owners in the state of New York. We have more buildings and more facilities than any other agency in the state. We have to bring our carbon footprint down, and that in, an, in its own will help build the economy of our state. Uh, we do live in every community across the state. 95% of all New Yorkers live within 15 miles of one of our campuses. Do we have a responsibility to enhance the vibrancy of our communities? You bet we do. And then, of course, we are global. We recruit many, many, many students from around the world. We send many of our faculty uh, across the country and around the world. So uh, this is a vision. Uh, that's our first report card. I have to say to you, uh, in this report card, we have metrics not only for making SUNY more competitive, you know, graduation rates and research dollars and number of faculty and academies and all the things that universities love to count but really hate U.S. News and World Report for counting. But in this report card, we also have several metrics about 
the economic welfare of the state of New York. And I did say this once at a, uh, a conference of higher education scholars, and one of them said, let me get this straight. You are going to hold the State University of New York accountable for problems you don't control. Well, yes. I think they are problems that everybody owns, but if we have uni at universities can explain the kind of impact we can have on an energy smart New York or getting more doctors to high need communities, we can hold ourselves accountable and that's what this report card does. That's what I say in my state of the university addresses. And so I've tried to make the case that an anchor institution that is land-grant-like, that was formed to serve the people of the state, can be an economic engine. So in the second of the three parts of my remarks, let me say a little bit more about how you become an economic engine at a statewide level. These dots and squares and triangles and circles represent uh, what I'm sure is true in California, incubators, innovation hubs, centers for advanced manufacturing, centers for technology. A theme I reiterate constantly is that we have lots of pieces and parts. They are simply not connected in a way that really impacts economic revitalization. So one of the things that SUNY's trying to do, because it believes in systemness, is to try to connect the dots across a very comprehensive state. Um, if these were darker than pastels, you would see a division of, of 10 economic regions, which were designed by Governor Cuomo, something he did when he was Secretary of HUD on a national level. So not only are we trying to get our act together for all these centers and hubs and and manufacturing sites uh, and incubators, we're trying to do it in the context of each of the regions that are being organized to drive economic growth across our state. And um, this picture of Governor Cuomo, I was not photoshopped in there. I actually stand by him on occasion, tells you that when a system says to a state, we can be your economic engine, there can be a return of investment in higher education. And I'd have to say that aside from the altruistic value of a large public university system choosing to play a role in economic revitalization, there's a selfish aspect too. If you can get the state to value what you do and show them the jobs that are created and the uh, salaries that are increasing and the students that are graduating and staying to live and work in your state, this legislature, this governor, returned the favor. He started investing real dollars in the four doctoral institutions of the State University of New York. He made up this NY SUNY 2020, it's kind of cool, and every time he says it, we cheer uproariously. Uh, and these are the four doctoral campuses where capital investments are being made that are truly going to transform the economy in Buffalo and on Long Island and in Binghamton and in Albany. But he didn't stop there. We have been tuition challenged in New York. Perhaps you can relate to this phenomenon. I'm not sure you can touch us, but I don't know what your tuition is. In 2009, when I arrived at SUNY, our tuition was $4,870. A credit hour? A semester? A year. $4,800. So we asked for rational tuition. It's a term that I think is idiosyncratic to New York, but it means what it would mean to public universities here in California. We asked that our tuition be predictable over a five-year period, that it be reasonable, 
and that it be sent to the campuses that collected the tuition. So you'd have to be a scholar of higher education funding to know the power of what I just said. But most states do not have a tuition plan beyond a year at a time. When the economy is bad, we charge more tuition. When the economy is good, we don't bother. And sometimes we keep the tuition money at the state. We don't send it to the campus. Rational tuition was a breakthrough. And maintenance of effort, which is a much more common term in funding higher education, means that the state set a plateau below which it will never drop again. And it set that plateau in 2011. That's maintenance of effort. These are two breakthroughs in public funding. Not, I know, the world you live in, but you live in California, and you need to be concerned about the state's support for public higher education. And uh, this governor is doing it, and he did it again in 2013, and we're thrilled. So I've tried to make a case, and I'll revisit it shortly, that universities can be economic engines, that they are, in some respect, obliged to be investors in the economic welfare of their communities. Universities also can be drivers of student success. And I have to say to those of you who are emerging scholars, our country has been riveted on access for a long time. In fact, a legislator in one of the states in which I have served once said, I don't care what you do with them, but let them in. You, um, you hear it all, you know. Um, but um, in the last four or five years, what have you seen? A real shift in our perspective from access being absolutely necessary to completion being the end of the story. So Obama has a goal of having us be the world leader in college-educated adults. Uh, Lumina, uh, Gates, the College Board, the National Governors Association, and literally every other organization I can think of has a completion agenda. That's the good news. The not so good news is that we have all different percentages of goals that we're striving for, 60%, 70%, the greatest in the world, you name it. And we have different deadlines for our ambition, 2015, 2020, 2025. And the bad news is we do not have a national strategy for completion. So we have a 1,000 points of light. We have a cottage industry, of a goal that once students enter, we are obliged toward their success. And uh, that's why we're adding a, a separate space in our heads to think about success. So uh, in this world of um, cacophony, uh, and I would say a world, a, a, a country that lacks a system of education. Uh, we have bits and pieces. Uh, we have tended toward uh, the concept that the goal of educating more people, the best bet any society can make, says uh, David Leonhardt, is to look at education as a seamless education pipeline. So the path I'm going to follow for the next few minutes is not unrelated to economic revitalization. In fact, it is core to economic revitalization. But again, we haven't done a very good job of conceptualizing the education pathway that we so want all Americans, young or old, to follow. So this is a pretty simple drawing actually, that education begins at birth or uh, in Cincinnati where there's a fabulous children's hospital, education begins prenatal and it doesn't stop until we get that student into a successful career or set of careers. Our obligation tends to be thought of at the higher end of this pipeline that begins at birth, but um, 
something that I think ed schools uh, should say and do say if they get it. We prepare the teachers who teach the students who come to college ready or not. We are obliged to the quality of education long before students darken our door. So we've managed to turn this really nice, clean slide into this. Because we're academics, you know? We just can't leave well enough alone. So it turns out that about six years ago, in Cincinnati, very frustrated with this statistic of every 100 ninth graders, while 75 of them may graduate high school, and 45 of those 100 might enter a college two or four years, and 34 of them might still be there their sophomore year, in Cincinnati, 17 of 100 ninth graders made it through to a baccalaureate diploma. And across the river in Kentucky, Covington and Newport, you remember Karen, 11. In Rochester, New York, among African American males, 9% are graduating from high school. This is a roadmap from cradle to career. The lower portion of the roadmap talks about the social welfare of our students, the upper part of the roadmap the academic life of our students, and the boxes and the lines are all about where interventions matter most. Typically, assessing whether kids are ready for kindergarten, and 40 to 50 percent of the children in this country come to kindergarten underprepared. And yes, there is a scale which you can actually measure kindergarten readiness. Third grade tells you another story in Albany, New York, in the four neighborhoods we are working with, less than 20% of the third graders are reading at third grade level. What do you think they're gonna do in the eighth grade, and in the 10th grade, and in the 12th grade, and when they come to college where we spend at SUNY alone $80 million on remedial courses? We're a public institution. We're an open access institution, and yet students come to us when we throw our doors wide open, not ready for college, and it is expensive, and it is teaching twice, and instead of saying to K-12, why don't you send us better students, we prepare the teachers who teach the students who come to college ready or not. We have to work with the pipeline. So in Albany and Rochester and even Clinton County, New York, up near Montreal, we are launching Cradle to Career Partnerships. Actually, Cradle to Career Collective Impact to finally get our community act together to get more students graduated college and career ready. And in our last convening around this concept, which originally in Cincinnati was called Strive and still is today, 84 cities came to our most recent convening to say, we want to know how to stem the leaks in the education pipeline. So we have about a do half dozen of these um, across the state of New York, and we have another 23 early college high schools. I'm sure you have early college high schools in California. I know you have a fabulous New Tech High School in the Napa Valley and others across the state. Uh, in our early college high schools, we are offering course credit to first-generation low-income students. These are not the students who take AP courses, but these are students who can excel in college-level coursework if you take the time to offer them the services. And 98% of the kids in these 23 early college high schools are on, uh, on uh, uh, prog progressing at a level that they will graduate high school, college, and career ready. We already have about 30% of our students who are diverse. We want more. We want to wipe out the need for remediation in our lifetime. So we have a big report with CUNY and our state legislature to do so. Uh, Adriana is involved in STEM. We're doing a lot of STEM work as well. 
And we're working on reforming our teacher education programs. We graduate about 5,000 teachers a year. We want them to be consumers of the Common Core curriculum. We want them to know how to do classroom assessment. And we want to educate them in a clinically rich environment. So uh, in working around completion, uh, we do pretty well at the four-year graduation rate, but we think we can close that gap. And just when we get to four-year graduation, people are going to start talking about three-year graduation, so you can't let up. You can't stop. Uh, we have a, a system that we've purchased called Degree Works, where we're tracking the individual progress of our students to make sure that they're moving through the system on time. We have a thing called reverse transfer. If you leave a community college before you have your associate's degree, but you complete the associate's degree while you're at a four-year campus, we send you back to uh, Monroe Community College, and they give you the two-year diploma. We know that college graduation rates for community colleges are very challenging, hovering in the 20% range, but with reverse transfer and acknowledging that students do complete their work, we might up that completion rate, double it, maybe triple it uh, as we move along. And uh, we're also working in adult completion. This is particularly where Lumina has played a role in more adults getting uh, finishing degrees from some college or no college. Uh, there is a statistic that if only 1% of the adults in New York were to finish their baccalaureate degree, it would increase personal income, per capita income, by about $17 billion. And I say to New York, you could tax that. That would be a good thing. We'd have more money if we have more educated people who are earning more. And so our transfer system, as you might imagine, is very complex because we've got 30 community colleges sending students to our 30 baccalaureate institutions. So let me talk a little bit about success. I'm adding to the equation access that leads to completion that leads to career or life success. So to the degree that economic development could be inspired by the relationship between access and completion to success, that's our, that's our story. So how would we define success if it's not completion? And uh, one of the ways we're beginning to think about success is through applied learning. Offering clinical applied learning experiences to all of our students. So I have to pause here a minute and say, uh, as Karen will recall, one of the things that made the University of Cincinnati famous is that it was believed to be the founder of cooperative education in America borrowed undoubtedly from the German tradition of apprenticeship. But the notion is that you would embed an internship in the curriculum or course of study for which students would be paid, get credit, be allowed time to exercise the internship in a company where the odds are 90% that the student will get a job offer from the company in which they intern. So there are lots of forms of this. There are degree programs that tell you you need an internship but do nothing to help you find it. Um, there are debates, the most recent one in the Education Life uh, Supplement to the New York Times this last Sunday, that there are a lot of students who are exploited through internships where they are given low-level assignments, they are not paid, they are not supervised, and they are not asked to turn in any evidence that their internship fit with their career goals. Um, and then there's co-op, where it is embedded in the curriculum, where the faculty embrace it, where you have partnerships with business and industry, where they agree to supervise the students and feed new knowledge back to your curriculum, and where there is a high level of job placement in the industries 
where students are placed for their co-op or internship experience. Uh, we'd like to add to this notion that uh, a study abroad is an applied experience as well. So we've managed to complexify internships by calling some of them SUNY Works, which is internships and co-op. Some of them SUNY Serves, which is students who do volunteer work. And some of them SUNY Discovers, which is students who are interning in a research laboratory or SUNY Global, where students are studying abroad. Um, and we try to track this uh, through internal mechanisms. And our goal is to put on the diploma and the transcript some kind of denotation that a, that a codified, supervised, credit generating, applied learning experience is a part of the experience a student has had at SUNY. So our goal, because we believe in systemness, is that every student at SUNY could either have a work experience, a volunteer experience, or a discovery experience, or an international experience, or one of each, and it would be denoted, supervised, credit worthy, on the transcript and on the diploma for all 400 and 65,000 students at SUNY. So um, to take one uh, more pass at success, the most recent effort, and one that I know Karen is particularly interested in, is what will be our response to online learning. And so we've created a concept called Open SUNY it worked when we were talking about the British Open University. It doesn't work so well when we're talking about MOOCs because Open has a whole new connotation. We're going to stick with it, though, because we have designed a concept that suggests that if we are able to attract another 100,000 students to an online degree program that has the potential to complete in three years that includes with it an applied learning experience that is supplemented by not more than but around a third of the courses being online from another university and maybe a certified MOOC, we think we might very well have a scalable, system-worthy approach to online learning. Now, I wanted to just quote my uh, good friend Tom Friedman, but of course I dropped my glasses, so I'm back. This budding revolution in global online higher education, he says, nothing has more potential to lift more people out of poverty by providing them an affordable education to get a job or improve the job they have. Nothing has more potential to unlock a billion more brains to solve the world's biggest problems, and nothing has more potential to enable us to reimagine higher education than the massive, open, online course, the MOOC, the platforms at Stanford, MIT, Coursera, and Udacity. Tom Friedman has a rhythm about him that when I get through it, I am so inspired I cannot turn back. I took the chancellorship at SUNY because I saw the possibility of taking big ideas to scale, turning a university system into an engine for economic and cultural revitalization, turning a university system into a place where access and completion and success are tethered together. So when I think of Abe Lincoln and Justin Morrill, or when I think of systemness, I think of one last observation that Tom Friedman made. He was talking about how the United States has the capacity to muster a kind of collective impact that could truly change our society, the kind of collective impact 
that a great, big, comprehensive, strapping, public, higher education system can have on the quality of life of its citizens. So we did a little editorial work here and uh, moved this uh, wording a little bit. If only we could come together in New York and across the country to enhance and expand our natural advantages, increased access, greater completion, universal success. Nobody could touch us. We're that close. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, we're going to go, uh, we're gonna go uh, casual here. Yes, we yeah. are. Thank you so but much. But I'm strapped to the mic. Um, I, if we can just thank you once again for oh, your remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we have a roving mic uh, just in the back there. So uh, we will take any questions that you have, I, I think, for the next, say, 10 to 15 minutes before we um, go to the Reception. Or advice, advice. We or like advice. advice. Um, or friendly criticism. We like that too. Or ideas. While people are germinating their ideas, I did have to ask you um, you put up the picture of the food and then said that this, you related this to your, your um, beliefs about leadership. Yes. That's five way skyline chili. Let's get so, that right, <laughs> Adriana. So. <laughs> Try to remember the name. Skyline Chili. Out then yet. So um, I was wondering that while people are germinating their ideas, if you, if you might uh, make the connection uh, more directly for us between the Skyline Chili and... Oh, I just borrowed something that said five-way because I like three, five, and ten. Uh, if I'm giving a speech, it might have three parts as it did today or five or ten. So when I happened on the Skyline Chili and then I'm thinking about le my leadership theory and wanting to remember what it was I thought I was trying to do, I just, uh, you know, that's the connection. But um, I do want to tell a, a little story about vision because I hope you see that the idea that SUNY could really be New York's key to revitalization is, is a big aspirational sort of visionary statement. In fact, I failed to say that we call this the power of SUNY. So our goal is to get people to go around saying, you know, I'm the power of SUNY. That is a visionary idea. So when I lived in Wisconsin, uh, the 150-year-old motto of the state of Wisconsin is that the boundaries of the University of Wisconsin would be the boundaries of the state. Anybody here from Wisconsin? You should know this. If Well, now you're not going to tell me that you're from Wisconsin, <laughs> but that's the Wisconsin idea. So in Milwaukee, not feeling like we were necessarily represented well in Madison, we decided that our vision for that strappy urban university would be the Milwaukee idea, that the boundaries of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee would be the boundaries of our community. So when I rolled into Cincinnati, the first journalist I met said, well, I suppose we're going to have the Cincinnati idea, as if presidents roam around the country taking whatever vision worked over here and seeing if you can get it to work over here. But it is so not true. It is so indigenous to USC to be who you are and to figure out who you are and to talk about it in ways that move the uh, aspirational dial. That's how I stumbled into a theory of leadership. I got to thinking about how critically important vision is and how important it is for the leadership of an organization to articulate that vision, a vision that hopefully is arrived at by many who live in the family of the organization. I've bought enough time. Hello. Dr. Zinfer, my name is Dan Maxey. I'm a second year PhD student working with Dr. Kizar. Um, You're very lucky. Uh, thank you, I, I know. Um, prior prior to, uh, to coming to uh, USC and, and studying higher education, I, uh, my professional experience was in government and politics in Washington, D.C. I, I worked in Washington for six years 
on a number of different issues, but as an outsider sort of coming into education, one of the questions and challenges that's always been very puzzling to me is why we don't have, why we as institutions as, and as educational leaders don't have conversations with the public and our elected leadership about the value of education and its impact on our communities and our state, our regions and our country. Well, I, I guess one of the things I'm a bit frustrated with is that we in higher education have spent way too much time with our handout. We're just so beyond ourselves that we're underfunded, that we just can't get over it. And uh, I, I will tell you, when I looked at the situation at SUNY, which has been underfunded for its entire life, it was told not to raise money because that would compete with the private sector. And don't have Division I athletics because the private sector has Division I athletics. It's, you know, if in fact it makes money, you be the judge. But I just feel like we have complained and the story that's really been heard by the public and public policymakers is just give us more money and we'll fix it. So, uh, I have tried to change that dialogue. Uh, it isn't the most popular thing to say to uh, my colleagues uh, in the faculty senate that economic uh, impact ought to be a driver until I tell them that if we were to make some money, we could hire some more faculty members, you know, but we don't have any money, so we're not hiring anymore. So it was a selfish step. But the other thing I'd want to say is when I do my State of the University address, and the only reason I do it is the governor starts out with the state of the state, and we're a great big we're not an agency, but we're a great big player in New York, so we ought to have one of these, too. My theme this year was, is college worth it? We have to be talking about all the millions of people who did become successful because they completed a degree, not Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know if you know Vivek Vodva. Anybody know him? He's an economist. He's, he's just fabulous because he's just right on the edge. And he says, you're not Mark Zuckerberg. Get over it. Stay in school. <laughs> it is something we need to say. So we are saying it. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my name is Constance Elo, and I'm a research assistant in the Pulia Center and also a doctoral student at the Rossier School of Education. Um, I was Congrats. really interested in your thoughts on um, online learning and scalability. And so I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about what mechanisms are in place to make sure as you're moving towards scalability that stratification and inequalities aren't embedded in those strategic moves? Well, uh, I, uh, I could have um, sort of talked about how we've arrived at Open SUNY for hours because in the ratio of 465,000 students who are pretty much residential, I mean, there are a lot of commuters in there, but it's still a bricks and mortar education. Uh, we all, we do already have a hundred online degree programs, um, but they are undersubscribed. So when I say we could maybe educate another hundred thousand people if we could figure out online, that's really why we're going to that strategy, because we're not educating enough people in America. And big systems like SUNY have to step up. I think Arizona State, Michael Crow is going from what, 45 to 90,000. But 90,000 isn't going to get there. 100,000 isn't going to get there. 500,000? Uh, we had uh, Bruce Malcolm. I don't know if you know Bruce Mal's work, but he's the director of his own Center for Massive Change. <laughs> Massive Change would be doubling the number of students we are served. How in the world are we going to do it? That said, do you want to know how many hurdles we've got to figure out? We don't have the IT platform to deliver for 100,000 students. We don't know how to assess MOOCs. We don't know how to insert them into the existing curriculum. We don't know how to ensure that students aren't cheating or that students are really the students. Um, we, <laughs> we don't know how to track their engagement. Were we to promise they could do it in three years, how in the world are we going to give them an applied learning experience? So 
I just named seven things. I have no idea how we're going to get there. But if we don't say that's the product and say it publicly, a big part of what I do, I say it very publicly. I watch the journalists write it down so that when I go to the faculty senate, I go, what do you want me to say? We changed our mind? No, we have to move. We have to move. The world is changing. This is going to happen. But for you, for your question about equity and protecting access and making sure that this is the great equalizer that Tom Friedman said it could be, big problem. I personally believe that the unit record can solve some of this. I am. Um, that's the individual student profile that your doctor already has on you. So they figured it out. We can figure it out. But when I um, testified to a congressional hearing on the unit record three years ago, four years ago, not only did they not pass a bill encouraging the federal government to help develop a unit record, they passed a bill saying there will never be a federal unit record. So if it's going to get done, if we're going to be able to track students and address the equity issues, then we have to know about our students, like your doctor knows about your health condition. And we're going to have to do that at the state level. If there, we've got all kinds of race to the top money to develop a student profile, and people are saying, 2050, 50, we might get that done. Not 15. So it's troublesome. And I don't know how we're going to build any accountability on the education system if we don't figure out a way to identify progress. How can you, you know, except for all the uh, security and privatization, which again, the health delivery system seems to be managing, we got to get there. Thank you Hi. So much. Hi, Dr. Zimpner. My name is Monica Esqueda, and I'm a doctoral candidate here at the Rossier School of Education. So earlier in your, your talk, you mentioned the notion of tuition dollars being sent back to the institution as is, is being really critical. Um, can you talk more about how that's being done? I ask because I know the University of California has tinkered with different right. funding options, and typically there have been tensions between some of the uh, less research intensive universities and the more highly research intensive universities about how dollars are allocated and whether that will contribute to gaps between those who have and those that do not. Yeah, well, um, we are in the throes of redesigning our resource allocation system at SUNY and that's why I'm going to stay in California. Uh, <laughs> it is really awful um, because um, we do not differentiate in New York the cost of uh, a baccalaureate education at a research university versus the cost of a baccalaureate institution at a so-called comprehensive institution. It's in our DNA. I think we got it from you guys. And uh, we, if you use the phrase differential tuition, you really can't go back to the state. So we have, a, we have a back and forth about this. And now I'm worried that if you incentivize enrollment growth, all you're really doing is cannibalizing one campus like Pac-Man, which is old, I know. But I mean that the, those who can gobble up those who can't. So there's some huge equity issues here. Um, that we're still struggling with as well, same as, as you are. What I wanted to say, though, is the incredulity of something that happened in, in New York three or four years ago would never happen under uh, Governor Cuomo. Um, we're one of those states where you can collect the tuition, but then you have to give it to the state, and then they appropriate it back to you. And four years ago, they kept 80%. I know, it's like, <gasps> because you see, we raised the money on the good faith that you were buying tuition, which would help improve the quality of your education. So when I say tuition money has to follow the student, that is one of the things we're kind of clinging to on our enrollment model. Wherever the students are, oh, guess what? That's where the money ought to go. So it brings in all kinds of questions about the right size of an institution. It's just, uh, it's very, very difficult, and we're working with people that Adriana and Bill Tierney and people in the uh, 
the center would know because Jane Wellman is trying to help us. NCHIMS, which is this national center for whatever those other letters stand for, they are in New York trying to help us. So the good news is we're trying to deal with it. And that is my theory about everything. Got a problem? Put it out there. And, and trust me, a big system that was highly decentralized by a couple of governors in the 70s and 80s, trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and make us more of a system, is every day an intense challenge. Uh, and, you know, institutions love their identity. You have your own. You have an identity that's different than, oh, let's say UCLA. And it matters. So what if somebody said to you, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put USC and UCLA together, and we're going to share services, and we might even share presidents. <gasps> I don't think you get the Watertown, New York Gazette. But if you wanted to, you could read a lot about the chancellor trying to suggest that Canton and Potsdam could maybe share a president because one of them is 2,000 students and the other one is like 4,000 students. But every campus wants a president, a provost, a dean of students, a CIO, a CFO, a what? We can't afford this anymore. But mergers and acquisitions are anathema to public policy, period, amen. You, you, can't, you can't merge a high school, you can't merge a school district, you can't merge a municipality, you can't merge a university. Read all the literature, Georgia, New Jersey, North, I don't know, we're right there with them. We're in the print, crazy. Thank you, do we have one, uh, one more question? Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> if not, then uh, let's thank our speaker one more time and we'll thank look you. forward to discussions about higher education systems, completion, success among students in the back. Please join us for some uh, refreshments. Thank you. <laughs>